I'm Kyle Malnati, your host of the Calibrate Real Estate Podcast. At Calibrate, we exist to help people create generational wealth through real estate. My personal mission is to encourage, empower, and educate you by sharing best practices from business leaders that are proven winners. Broadcasting from the Mile High City, thank you for tuning in to episode 128 of the Calibrate Real Estate Podcast. My name is Kyle Malnati. I'm your host. Our esteemed guest is Adam Smith. Some of you may know Adam Smith as The Economist. This is a different Adam Smith. This is the president and founder of Colorado Real Estate Finance Group. It's been in the mortgage industry for a number of years, an award-winning mortgage loan originator. And I like it because Adam's from Colorado. Adam, welcome to our show. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, I appreciate the Adam Smith joke. I haven't heard that one yet today. Well, I'm full of dad jokes. I'm full of corny <laughs> jokes. So they'll keep rolling. Excellent. Most importantly, Adam is, a, is an author and his best-selling book, Just the Tips, we're going to have a great discussion about lead generation. And I think that at this time, of course, but really any time in any business, lead generation is the lifeblood of your industry as a salesperson. So Adam, when you're talking to realtors, when you're talking to other mortgage loan originators, when you're doing your podcast, which is called How I Met Your Mortgage, which I love, by the way, on Mondays, what are some of the things that you're reminding sales professionals as it relates to lead generation? And why did you write a book? Well, I would say the crux of it, the number one thing that we try to instill in everybody is that we really all have two roles. You are a real estate agent. I am a mortgage originator, the insurance salesman, the financial planner, whatever the case may be. And we all have this robust amount of work that has to go into that particular job. But the second job, which is probably the more important one, is that we all have to generate leads. Without generating leads in the real estate industry, for example, you don't have listing appointments. You don't have inspections. You don't have negotiations. You don't have uh, appraisals. You don't have closings. And most importantly, you don't have commissions. Um, I would say that lead generation is probably the crux of everything that has to be done. And the rest of it is a a byproduct of that in, in essence. And for the most part, everything that's ancillary to generating leads is probably something you or I can pay someone else to do. Obviously, generating leads, that's something that Kyle has to do. That's something that Adam has to do. You're the face of the company. You're the rainmaker, those kinds of things. But the infinite details, the uh, contract dates, the uh, appraisals being ordered, whatever those happen to be in our respective businesses are things that I pay my team to do while I am the one out there doing things like this and generating leads, writing a book, working on my coaching company, so on and so forth. Um, so generating leads is probably one of the most important things, if not the most important thing that we try to instill in what salespeople do and that it really has to be one of their two jobs. I love that you share that because it's absolutely true. And I think it becomes that much more in your face for lack of a better description, when you have a situation like the COVID-19 pandemic, that the world starts really shutting in. Some places called it shelter in place here in Colorado, stay at home orders. We're now in safer at home orders. It seems like people for sure in the residential real estate business are back out there. We're seeing deals close. Uh, there was a little bit of a gap where it was confusing. Can we do showings? Can we not? But lead generation becomes very apparent when all of a sudden, like I did, you have a, a St. Patrick's Day massacre on March 17th and every single commercial deal I was working on died within one week. It's $6 million worth of production down the drain, never to be done again. Now those might resurrect at some point. We might be able to resuscitate those deals, but the commercial market is, is really battered. The residential market though, every other deal I had that was residential has closed since then. And so lead generation, I think for a lot of people, you get all of a sudden isolated, you stay at home, you realize pretty quickly, like, I need some more leads. So what are some of the things, if someone needs to jumpstart the car of their uh, sales uh, business or that sales engine, what are some very practical, uh, simple things that you suggest people get started with right now? And I know that in your book, Just the Tips, you've got sales and life hacks to get you through your year. And you do that on a daily basis in the book. And so what are some of the things that you like to share with people as very easy things they can do right away to generate leads? 
Well, I would say the easiest one, the most practical one, and potentially the most profitable one is pick up the phone. Call people, call your past clients, call your leads, call your advocates, those kinds of things. Uh, I once had a colleague said to me, uh, say to me, excuse me, that she got nervous, anxious when the phone rang. And my take on that was, boy, I get anxious if the phone's not ringing. And if it's not ringing, I pick it up and make it ring somewhere else. Um, I would say that the brunt of both my lead generation in my mortgage business, as well as what we would suggest to people doing while we're sheltered in place or safer at home, and yes, watching the uh, governor put us on that roller coaster right of what went on in your business here locally was uh, something else. Um, but yeah, picking up the phone is certainly a big, big deal. And right now, while people are sheltered in place or safer at home, they want to talk to outside people. I love the five people or the four other people in my home. And I love the five people that are in my office on a full-time basis. But having no outside interaction with other than those 10 people makes me a little antsy. And I guarantee you, all of the people at the other end of that phone, if you guys will pick it up and use it, feel the same way. They want to interact with people. We are so starved for that right now that having a phone conversation is going to be so much easier than you've ever experienced before. I think it's a great opportunity to share that if you're not watching on YouTube, you certainly don't have to stop if you're on Apple Podcasts or if you're on Spotify. But above Adam's head, it says text tips, T-I-P-S, to 63566. Again, that's tips to 63566. Adam, if someone does that, what will they expect? Are they going to get spammed um, uh, just you know, out, out the wazoo? Are they going to get all sorts of text messages? What, what happens when someone texts tips to 63566? Uh, it automatically signs them up for daily cat facts. No, I'm kidding. Um, so it, they will get a single response. They're not going to get texted beyond that. Um, but they're going to get a number of links on how to get a copy of my book uh, to our website. Uh, they'll get a link to see episodes of our weekly podcast. Again, How I Met Your Mortgage. Uh, we also do a weekly blog for salespeople, a video blog called The Weekly Little Tip. And just a two minute quick tip on something people can be doing to help build their repeat and referral business. Um, so yeah, they'll get a good amount of content back. But now, unfortunately, just the one text, we won't uh, uh, send them anything else beyond that. I think that's great. And I think it's important to, to de debunk the fear because I think that happens a lot where they say, if I'm going to text this to that, am I just going to get blasted? And I think it's great. We're going to give you doses, links, different things that you need. And then outside of that, just good, valuable content. Yeah. And, and they can subscribe to any of that that they want at that point. If it's the weekly podcast or the weekly little tip there, that's certainly up to them, but no, we don't do any data capture on it and we don't, uh, text those numbers uh, from any other source. Love it. And my, my Calibrate tribe, I call them Calibrate Calvin or Calibrate Cali if it's a guy or a gal, but that realtor that's out there, and I'm thinking of one specific person, we'll call this person a, a Calibrate Calvin. When they're doing phone prospecting, and I have a script, I have some things that I naturally say, what do you find as a lead generator yourself, Adam, just whether it's statistically or anecdotally is most effective for you when you've got someone on the phone? As you shared, you've got these 10 people in your life, both your work life and your personal life. And once you're outbound lead generating, what are some things that you're sharing on the phone that you feel like get the best return on investment? How long do you spend on you know, a, a phone call if you're reaching out to someone that's in your sphere or as part of a past clientele? Um, what are some of the things that you're saying or what do you think is effective when people are doing phone calls? Because for someone like myself, who's literally made, I, I haven't counted it out specifically, but I've probably made over a hundred thousand dollar, a hundred thousand prospecting phone calls, which end up leading to a hundred thousand dollar commissions at times. Uh, there's just a few, but when, when you make that many dials to start your career, and I did, I was a cold caller, canvasser, prospector, and have done a lot of business that way. There's a lot of reluctance and a lot of fear to just even picking up that phone. There's, they call it call reluctance. And so what, what should someone say if they've never implemented a call strategy with their lead gen? Well, in the interest of full disclosure, I still make literally hundreds of outbound non-transaction related 
lead generating phone calls a week. Um, so this is a technique that I've exercised for what's probably close to 20 years, still do it, it still works. I think what's important to understand in a business like yours, like mine, uh, for anybody who has a direct-to-consumer sales type gig for high ticket items, homes, mortgages, some vehicles, insurance, financial planning, et cetera, that it's still about relationship building. We're not talking about real estate. We're not talking about mortgages when we make these phone calls. We are simply furthering those relationships. How are you? How's the wife and kids? How's work? Just having conversations with these people, doing a 90-10 rule, more importantly focused on the who you are, not the what you do. If you're picking up the phone and having these conversations with people and they don't know what you do, you're already failing. We need to go back a few steps. So the conversations should really circumnavigate around the who you are, what you're like, what you're into, your sense of humor, your tone, your inflection, et cetera. Really talking about things that are helping you solidify relationships with these people to ensure that relationships become friends, friends become clients, and that's just the nature of how this thing works. But I would say the biggest tactical, tractional tip that I could give when it comes to these phone calls is do more listening than talking. You want to ask pointed questions? By all means, do that. But people want to tell you about themselves, where they're at, what they're into, what is going on with them, how they're dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, et cetera. Just listen. Listening is the far, maybe the greatest sales skill when it comes to doing work on the phone that anyone can have. So listening is important and I completely agree but as a chatty salesperson, oftentimes that can be difficult. You it's can, very difficult. You can focus in on how great you are, the deal you just did, and all of a sudden forget that you're trying to get information and that'll enable you to help serve that person. So what are some good questions that you're asking? Open-ended, obviously pointed questions are going to be more specific to the relationship, but you talked about Ford, you know, family, occupation, rec recreation, and dreams. That's a very classic sales acronym, but what are some things you do, some prime the, the pump conversation starters that if someone's again reluctant to get on the phone that you can ask without feeling like you're salesy. And that's the biggest thing I hear within my own brokerage firm is I don't know what to say to someone. I don't want to sound schwarmy or salesy or, or you know, like I'm attacking that person. I'd rather speak to someone I don't know and, and ask questions than someone that might say they don't want me or they don't want to work with me. So what are some things that you're doing within your clientele on the phone that help really prime the pump and make those conversations a little bit easier. Well, and I do think that that's a good point and a legitimate concern for everybody who's using the phone in their sales gig. No question about it. Uh, every one of us has experienced that. Every one of us has had those thoughts, those fears. None of you listening or watching are alone, I promise. One, I think that there's an important mindset shift that needs to occur. These people need your services. People need to buy and sell real estate. People need to finance their homes. People need to buy insurance. If you're coming at everything you do, and certainly all of these phone conversations or your social media work, your video work, whatever the case may be, from a position of merely wanting to help people and not necessarily selling or closing a deal, you're going to have a much greater result. When it comes to something that's more tactical and tractional, um, just some good ideas in your line of work, in my line of work, there are a lot of seasonal issues that may very well uh, come about. Um, in our client database, we do a biannual review of everybody's file. That's always a good excuse to call and say, hey, your file popped up for biannual review. Looks like you guys are good unless you tell me you need to take cash out to buy a new kidney. I think you should just stand pat. Um, that's one certainly that we would uh, exercise on a regular basis. Um, tax time is a great one, especially right now as tax deadlines have been delayed. Reaching out to your past clients, reaching out to leads, hey, do you have everything you need to prepare tax returns? Did you get your county tax statement? Did you get the 1098 from the mortgage company? Is there anything I can do, any documentation I would have or can obtain to help you or your tax preparer get that finalized? Those kinds of things. Obviously, holidays, 
birthdays, anniversaries, home purchase anniversaries. There are lots of reasons that you could be reaching out to your client database, to your leads, to your advocates via telephone and come up with things that you can certainly discuss off the cuff, or at least they think it's off the cuff, where you're not going to feel that you're pressuring them, that you're having a conversation in a swarmy, salesy manner, and that you are literally just doing what you can to help them to further their goals and to further that relationship. Those are all great tips. And I can clearly see why you wrote a book called Just the Tips, because I, I personally am like, oh, those are great things to be thinking about. And a couple things to add to it is not only the annual um, anniversary of their purchase of the property, um, you should be, if you're a top salesperson, following up with every single person you did business with last year in January or February and providing them with their, their closing disclosure and or their settlement statement, because a lot of times people need that for tax purposes and they typically will have a difficult time finding that if you closed six months prior. So that's a great thing. And then come tax time as it relates to property tax evaluations, one of the best strategies I've implemented, and it's been over a decade now, is every two years, at least in the state of Colorado, we have the assessors reassess property and every single person is asking for comps. And it's a great way to reach out to your class past clientele. And it's a great way to generate new business with someone you've never done business with before. So I think those are a, great, a couple of great tips that you've provided. And I'll add a few of those on top of it as well. All right, Adam, why did you write a book? And how did you write a book as an aspiring author? And as someone that's been a thought leader, obviously, I've got a podcast with over 125 episodes now. How in the world did you find the time to operate a business, have a family life? Obviously, you've got other things, recreations, things that you like to do. How and why did you write a book? No, it's a funny story. Um, years ago, uh, I was asked to speak at a mortgage conference and subsequently this particular group have become some of my closest friends. A lot of them will attend our event here in the fall. Um, I uh, spoke at their conference in Austin back in February, back when we used to have conferences and go places, see people, do things. Um, so this first conference that they hosted and asked me to come speak at, the uh, one of the organizers said, hey, bring your printed materials and you can put them in the back of the room and if people want to buy them, they can buy them. And silence, literally crickets for the next 30 seconds. It's like, well, I, I don't really have any printed materials that would you know, uh, entertain or be applicable to this crowd. And that was really the catalyst for me saying, boy, I really should have some kind of content that would not only lend to that credibility and give me the opportunity to really put all of this down on paper and to certainly generate revenue and further our coaching company and so on and so forth. Um, so I decided I would take it upon myself to do this. Not by myself, mind you. Um, certainly my wife was full of encouragement and prodding. Um, a lot of these people were uh, certainly uh, full of that kind of encouragement. And my team here at the uh, mortgage office and at the coaching company really pushed and pushed. Uh, one of them even made a giant poster and tacked it to the wall in my office saying, write five pages today. And uh, while I'm not uh, big on the whole paper and pen type of environment, I think things should be done in a, uh, an electronic uh, manner, as certainly a, uh, when it comes to your calendar for certain, I literally put it in my calendar. And one of the tips is that happiness is a well-oiled calendar. Time blocking is of the utmost importance to be successful to write five pages every day. I blocked off 30 minutes every morning, early in the morning to write five pages. Once the book was completed, I used that same time block to edit 10 pages. And forgive me, it's been oh, a couple of years now since the uh, book was written and published. Well, about a year and a half, I guess, since it was published. Um, so it may have been 10 pages, but literally I use that same time block, edit 10 pages. And every morning for 30 minutes in that time block, I would do the editing. Um, I did reach out to a couple of colleagues, um, including, oh, Jen Duplessis, who's also a great uh, mortgage coach uh, on the East Coast and asked her to write a foreword as well as another colleague in the South. Um, then I sent it off to a legitimate editor uh, and she uh, came back uh, with some uh, recommended changes. Um, 
uh, including uh, toning down some of the uh, inappropriate language, but that's uh, my nature. And obviously we're doing that here for your broadcast as well, Kyle. Um, obviously the innuendo still remains with anything called just the tips. Um, and yeah, then we did a uh, Kindle Direct. Uh, it's self-published, we use Kindle Direct Publishing. Uh, put it out on Amazon, did a couple of book launch parties, one in Austin, Texas, one in Denver. And yeah, it's just uh, brought us great success. Uh, it's so fun. And congratulations. That's something that a lot of people aspire to do and, and never actually accomplishes is writing a book. However, it sells just the fact that you've written a book is incredible. And then to have a best selling book is is wonderful. And I think it, what I imagine you found in the process is while you may have started doing that as a personal goal and a personal objective, I'm sure that you found that your reach and your impact and the response that you get from it is probably far more fulfilling just even than completing the book, hearing some of the feedback from your own audience and from your own tribe and the people who are getting value and sharing, gosh, this tip was awesome. I've implemented this one and it's, you know, lead generation here has added this 10 X to my, uh, to my profit loss statement or to my gross commission income. So I'm sure that that's very rewarding to you. It is. And just from an anecdotal standpoint, um, well, one, it certainly took our reach from being local, and I say that to Colorado, to a certainly a more national or even uh, continental uh, type of level. But uh, we had attended a conference, and I spoke at the conference, and uh, just as you would expect, we were selling copies of the book in the back of the room. And as I was leaving town, I walked past a multiple of gates at the airport, I'm sure. And somebody was sitting in front of a gate waiting to catch their flight reading the book. And to see somebody That's sitting great. in an airport reading my book was really the catalyst for, wow, look at what I've accomplished. Yeah, that, that was really that, the light bulb. On the vision board. when, when you Absolutely. Say, someone's actually going to be reading it. I've heard authors say that, that they'll be on a plane and someone will, know, someone will be reading a book and they won't notice that the author is sitting next to them and they're reading their book. And how cool is that? It is. No question. And I have had other people, uh, certainly on airplanes, inquire about uh, the book. I uh, remember a particular flight where I gave a copy to one of the flight attendants. And when I sat back down in my seat, the woman sitting next to me asked if uh, I had authored that book, if I had penned that book. And I did. And it uh, sparked an interesting subsequent conversation. One more follow-up to being an author from an aspiring author who's not written uh, a full-length book is, would you have changed anything now that you've gone through it? Are there some things that you learn? You're like, oh, I really struggled here. And once I got through it and finished it, a lot of times when you reach your destination, you kind of look back and say, I took a couple of turns left and right that it may have delayed me some time or, or just things you learned that you wouldn't do again or things that you realized were very part of the success of obviously creating the book as well. Um, I think the way that the book is written is very unique. Um, it is essentially a toilet book. You could flip it open to any page and read a paragraph and go back 100 pages and go forward 50 pages. Um, I would change the content some just because since it was finished and published, we've come up with a lot more. So maybe there's a sequel in the works would be uh, equally appropriate. But um, it was certainly a learning experience. There's no question. Um, I would say the most difficult part that required getting over the hump was to actually just sit down and do it, do the work, buckle down and get it done. Uh, the time blocking made an enormous uh, impact that way. But no, I don't think I would do it much differently other than changing a little bit of the content. I enjoy that you shared that the sitting down, the grinding it out, the work is, is probably the most difficult part because that dovetails right into lead generation. I think most people look at a sterling business or a sterling brand or I'll see people say, I see how many properties you've sold. You guys are just crushing it. And what they typically see is the end result, not the work or the journey in between. And, and I think lead generation is exactly that. Oh, it is absolutely. Um, and it's funny, I, years ago, I had a colleague uh, who was attending a conference that I was speaking at ask me, what's the one thing you would tell somebody to do to get where you're at? And I said, work hard for 20 years. Yeah, there, there's no magic for potion. 20 years and you're, you're an overnight success after 20 years. <laughs> absolutely. There's no magic potion. There's no unicorn. Work hard for 20 years and you will have success as well. 
All right, as a reminder, text TIPS to 63566. And you had shared, you, um, you gave us a little bit of a segue opportunity, but you had shared a moment ago that you have this mastermind and this event that you do each September. It's a two-day event, 10 speakers, 50 to 100 select guests. Why did you start doing that? What is the content, of course, and what are some things that you're learning as a host of a mastermind like that? All good questions. Um, so yes, this will be our fourth uh, year doing it. It's September of every year and we do host it here in Denver. The catalyst for doing it was really the robust number of conferences that I've attended, mostly in the mortgage space where the cost was excessive, the content was lackluster, and that they were soliciting to people uh, for these conferences who were looking for a magic potion that we all know doesn't exist. They were literally praying, harping on the fact that these were people who were desperate for a change in their business. They needed some kind of reboot, some kind of magic potion, as it were. And then they were literally just spending that time selling these people more things they didn't need and couldn't afford. And there is a robust amount of conference work going out there like that in mortgages, in real estate, in every avenue that you can imagine. Uh, one of the speakers uh, that we have coming this year actually will speak about how to get yourself on stage, how to get yourself in front of audiences. And I have seen her speak twice, once at Social Media Day and again at PodFest in Orlando that we discussed before we went live uh, or before we started recording. And I think her statistic is that there are something, or there were pre-COVID, something like 5,000 conferences a day in this country. So you can find an avenue, there's no question. So taking all of that into effect, we certainly wanted to provide something that was of legitimate value at a low cost with a select group and provide content that just cannot be beat. So of those 10 speakers, some are in the real estate space, some are in the mortgage space, some are in the social media space. And really, we're just trying to provide content on lead generation. Like I mentioned, Felicia Jones, she's an amazing speaker. Uh, the day prior to PodFest, uh, Jen, my marketing director and one of our other coaches, uh, she and I spent the day in a private event with maybe two dozen other people that she put on specifically on how to get on stage, how to get in front of audiences. That will be one of them. Uh, another speaker, and she's actually a, re a repeat, a return speaker, uh, talks about thriving in chaos, how to deal with the chaotic issues that come up in your business any day, every day, how to get past them, how to continue to stay on mission, those kinds of things. Um, so they, we really do try to focus on lead gen, business building, and eventually how to get to a strict repeat and referral business that if you step away from, continues to grow. That's great. So we're nearing the end of our interview. And one of the things I ask all of our guests is some pre-scripted questions. And sometimes that can be rapid fire. Other times it'll produce a five minute answer. So are you game for that, Adam? Absolutely. Okay. So as an author, I can imagine that you've been inspired by other authors or other books that you just feel like are your go-tos and maybe you reference them once a year on an ongoing basis. What are some of your favorite books and or authors for sales professionals or just uh, personal growth? What are some of the things that you really like as it relates to great, great works of art in books? Well, um, I think the two that circumnavigate what we try to practice and preach, um, the first one is by an author by the name of Ryan Stuman, who uh, is the hardcore closer. That's how he, that's his brand. Um, and I've known Ryan for a number of years, but his first book, Kick Ass, Take Names, Numbers, and Email Addresses, is really good content on building that audience, building that contact database, no matter what you want to do in your lead generation, your marketing, your prospecting, you've got to have an audience, a text campaign, a snail mail campaign, an email campaign, a voicemail campaign, like you and I discussed before we started recording, requires an audience. Uh, the other is a colleague of mine by the name of Chad Prio, that's uh, actually spelled prior for those of you listening, P-R-I-O-R. Uh, but Chad wrote a book um, that basically 
identifies taking imperfect action. And I think it's actually called the art of getting shit done. Pardon my language. Um, but Chad preaches, and he's absolutely right, that we all need to take imperfect action. Whatever you guys are formulating right now for those types of campaigns, whether it's your podcast or uh, a snail mail campaign or how to do good contact management, get started. Let it come into shape. Let it come into form as you go. Do not let that analysis paralysis make a victim of you. Get started. Take imperfect action. So those are two that I really, really recommend when it comes to uh, what circumnavigates the art of lead generation, business building, having a strict repeat and referral business, those kinds of things. Thank you, Adam. And I'll share as a testimonial, I receive text message blasts. I receive voicemail campaigns from Adam. And that's one of the reasons why we got connected and it's very effective. So as I might ask a follow-up question, how does one, and I'm sure they can go and, and read the book, but how does one actually start doing that? If they're thinking about some sort of voicemail campaign and or text message campaign, how do you even get started with that? I'm sure there's resources. Oh, absolutely. Um, clearly, without equivocation, audience first. You've got to have one. You've got to identify who you're sending that message to. And in anything that you're going to do in that kind of a campaign, whether it's social media, voicemail, text, email, etc., always, always audience first. What does your audience want to see, hear, read, or watch from you? And that should be Absolutely. Item number one for your consideration when you're doing a video, when you're writing a book, when you're coming up with a voicemail broadcast script, when you're coming up with the copy that you're going to use in an email or a text campaign, always consider the audience first. What do they want to see, hear, read, or watch? Okay. Is it valuable content to them? It doesn't matter what you want to see, hear, read, watch. It only matters what they want to see, hear, read, and watch. So that's certainly number one. Then I would start probably do some research on what avenue your audience, again, audience first, is going to be most receptive. Are you dealing with a lot of baby boomers? They might very well be people who still listen to terrestrial radio. Maybe you want to record an hour-long show and buy time slots for it. I know a lot of people in my line of work that have great success with that in the reverse mortgage space. Maybe your audience is going to be more prone to email and you want to come up with email copy and then you want to do some research into what kind of an email campaign service, whether it's MailChimp or something to that effect, that can provide you that. Maybe your audience is a hair younger than that like me and they circumnavigate around Facebook and you want to focus on Facebook activity. What kind of copy do you want to be putting in your post? Do you want to do a Facebook messenger campaign? Do you want to focus your efforts on Facebook groups? Maybe they're a little younger still and you want to switch that to Instagram or text, but always, always audience first. So, well, uh, I don't remember when it was, maybe a couple years ago, I actually had the privilege of sharing the stage with Gary V uh, oh, wow. at a mortgage event. And Gary said something that at the time was absolutely mind boggling, but that uh, he opened uh, this conversation with someday somebody's going to say, Alexa, get me a mortgage. Alexa, find me a realtor. Interesting. And what do you need to be doing? Because by then, and this, when he said it to me, it was a decade out. SEO is dead. The, that whatever the optimization that's going through Google Voice, Alexa, et cetera, is going to far surpass whatever you're doing in search engine optimization because search engines will go the way of the dodo. Um, and he said the way to do that is to have 40, 40 pieces of content across all social media platforms a day. Wow. That's the look I gave. And I was actually sitting right next to a colleague, uh, actually the woman who said she got anxious when the phone rang, she didn't do well as a loan originator, but she does do very well doing basically the same thing for that Jen does for me for a colleague's mortgage company in California. I'm sitting next to her and she also had that same look that you just did, 40, because that's her role. That's what she and Jen do. So taking a 30 or 45 minute interview like this, and this is exactly what we do with How I Met Your Mortgage, Jen can extrapolate 
a dozen pieces of content out of that particular interview and use that for some of that social media content. Um, but yeah, as far as sharing this, I guarantee you she's excited about that as well. So yeah, she's going to be very, very jazzed with uh, what the results of this will be for her, for you, for I, uh, when it comes to all of the great social media content that she'll be able to put together over the next couple of weeks from it. Those all sound like great ways to initiate a phone call to your past clients, doesn't it? Absolutely. Isn't that fun? It can be that simple. You just say, and I'm thinking about this with my own database. We're putting out a newsletter. We do that once a quarter. We do it a handful of times a year. And you think about what would you like to le learn about? What would you like to read about? What would you like to hear about? And those are great ways, just open-ended questions. And it, it generates value. You're already going to put the content out there anyways. Most of us are. But this is helping you really refine that and polish that, uh, that program that you already are doing. And it gives you a great way to reconnect with your clients. I love that answer. Okay, next question I ask all of my guests is this concept of Dear Younger Me. It comes from a song that I really like by the band Mercy Me. And the idea, the concept is you're writing yourself a letter when you were younger and it's some of the advice you wish you knew when you were 22. That's the, that's not from the song, but that's the way I've dubbed it. The advice you wish you knew when you were 22. So Adam Smith, what advice would you give yourself if you were able to intersect and talk to yourself uh, when you were in your twenties, now that you've got a little gray in the beard. And then the follow-up to that is what advice would you give to someone on your team or someone that comes to you that's real important, a niece or a nephew or someone like that that is in their 20s that says, hey, Uncle Adam, how do I, how do, I do this? How do I do that? Or you know, what advice would you give for me? Well, looking back on it now, and obviously this is an answer that changes probably monthly or yearly, no question. Giving that piece of advice to myself I wish I'd gotten started in all of this sooner. I wish I'd started originating mortgages sooner. I wish I'd started coaching people sooner. I would be years ahead of where I am now. But again, in your 20s, that's very difficult. It's difficult, more difficult to see the big picture. The other one, coincidentally, I have a child in their 20s. Um, she's my oldest, a fairly recent college graduate. I guess it's been a couple of years now. Um, and she has done things since finishing college that I wish I had done then that a lot of people didn't get to do. And maybe it's a generational thing, but she's been traveling the world. Um, on a whim, hey, do you want to come to London for the weekend? Absolutely. You want to go see Milan? Unfortunately, she was actually in Italy when the world started to fall apart and then went back to her place in Brooklyn. So she really uh, experienced the very, very pinnacle of what the uh, coronavirus had to bring. Um, but yeah, see the world, travel, uh, do the kinds of things that now at my age, I pine to do upon retirement. And I have to wait until then now in order to do them, whereas she's going to be able to do them in her 20s. It's interesting. And you may call it the millennial generation. You may just say younger people. We are seeing a lot of people that are saying, I'm graduating from college. And for the next couple of years, I'm going to do what most people aspire to do when they're 65. And they may have the right perspective there and, and trying to take care of some of these whether you call it bucket list items or just things you can't do. And all of a sudden you have, you know, a mortgage and you've got the responsibility of rearing and raising children. Those are the things that you should do when you're in your twenties. So that's a great answer. All right. The final question I ask, and it's a question, the answer actually came out of that question you just answered. So I interviewed my coach, a guy named Chris Oakley, who has since passed away. And his answer was um, to this question. It's a, it's a legacy uh, question his answer was he was required in his 20s to read a book called The Principle of the Path by Andy Stanley. And the book, if you haven't read it, and I have not, but the way that Chris describes it to me was it basically has an exercise where you have to write your own obituary, which is very foretelling because he passed away this, this December at a, at a young age and it was a tragic accident. And basically that concept of writing your own obituary put a mission statement for his own life in place. And he was always living on a mission. And I felt like even though he passed early, he was doing life the right way. So if there's something, someone's penning an obituary or a eulogy for you, Adam Smith, what would you want them to say? 
That is a great question. Uh, very difficult. I, I hope there's a way to truncate this appropriately so that it would read in an obituary or on a headstone. But I think the goal, the way that I want to live to make the biggest impact in whatever time I have left, and that could be today, next year, or another 50, is to help as many people as I can in that time frame. Our mortgage clients, put as many people to work in my company as I can, help them pay their bills, help our clients pay their bills. To be perfectly honest, I could walk away from the mortgage business, provide a similar income in my coaching practice, but the ability to give 10 people a job and help them through their path is crucial to me. I would never, ever be able to give that up. So I, I would hope that people see it as Adam just wanted to help as many people as he could in the time he had. That's an incredible answer. And what a dignified response to why you operate a business is you give other people opportunity. And I just love the way that we can end our show today. So Adam Smith, author, mortgage loan originator, speaker, coach, Go get just the tips. You can text if you want a sampling. You can text tips to 63566. Again, Adam P. Smith, just the tips. And Adam, if people want to connect with you on social media, connect with you uh, if they need uh, help, advice with a mortgage, what's the best way that they can reach out to you? Uh, everything through the coaching uh, program is pretty much just the tips, uh, our Instagram handle, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, Adam P. Smith is the most common for our mortgage company, uh, but the easiest way to find us that way is probably by texting CORE, C-O-R-E, 263566. Great. Well, for Jen, who's been auditing, Adam Smith, our esteemed guest, Kayla Davis, our podcast producer, I'm Kyle Malnati, and as I love to say, we will see you around the neighborhood. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Adam. Uh, I don't remember when it was. Maybe a couple years ago, I actually had the privilege of sharing the stage with Gary V uh, oh, at a wow. mortgage event. And Gary said something that at the time was absolutely mind boggling, but that uh, he opened uh, this conversation with someday somebody's going to say, Alexa, get me a mortgage. Alexa, find me a realtor. Interesting. And what do you need to be doing? Because by then, and this, when he said it to me, it was a decade out. SEO is dead. The, that whatever the optimization that's going through Google Voice, Alexa, et cetera, is going to far surpass whatever you're doing in search engine optimization because search engines will go the way of the dodo. Um, and he said the way to do that is to have 40, 40 pieces of content across all social media platforms a day. Wow. That's the look I gave. And I was actually sitting right next to a colleague, uh, actually the woman who said she got anxious when the phone rang, she didn't do well as a loan originator, but she does do very well doing basically the same thing for that Jen does for me for a colleague's mortgage company in California. I'm sitting next to her and she also had that same look that you just did, 40, because that's her role. That's what she and Jen do. So taking a 30 or 45 minute interview like this, and this is exactly what we do with How I Met Your Mortgage, Jen can extrapolate a dozen pieces of content out of that particular interview and use that for some of that social media content. Um, but yeah, as far as sharing this, I guarantee you she's excited about that as well. So yeah, she's going to be very, very jazzed with uh, what the results of this will be for her, for you, for I, uh, when it comes to all of the great social media content that she'll be able to put together over the next couple of weeks from it.